What does God require in the sixth, seventh, and eighth commandments? Six, that we do not hurt or hate or be hostile to our neighbor, but be patient and peaceful, pursuing even our enemies with love. Seventh, that we abstain from sexual immorality and live purely and faithfully, whether in marriage or in single life, avoiding all impure actions, looks, words, thoughts, or desires, and whatever might lead to them. Eighth, that we don't take without permission that which belongs to someone else, nor withhold any good from someone we might benefit. In these three commandments, the love of neighbor is described. The second table of the commandments describes the way in which we live together as a human society. Old Testament scholar Patrick Miller has said, these describe the nature of the good neighborhood, the kind of society that flourishes because there's deep and profound social trust that we will seek the good rather than the harm of the neighbor. Bruce Waltke, a wonderful Old Testament scholar of our day, one of my colleagues has noted that the person who behaves in this way is one who's willing to disadvantage themselves for the sake of others. The person who dishonors God and disobeys these is one who's willing to disadvantage the community for his or her own good. That's really the issue here. These commandments speak to our deep and profound desire for justice to be served, to enjoy sexual intimacy, and to be able to enjoy material goods. The remarkable truth of it is that Christianity celebrates these three things. Christianity celebrates our innate desire for justice to be served. God has created a world that has a moral order. God has given us a law. God has implanted a conscience within us that's both innate and nurtured by our society so that we do yearn for respect. We do yearn for justice to be served. We do yearn for order, for the world to be put to rights. God has also created us to be sexual beings, and so we do yearn and ache for sexual intimacy. Christianity in no way mocks or demeans, much less maligns or dismisses our longing uh, for sexual intimacy, for physical and emotional uh, ways of enjoying our relational intimacy. Finally, Christianity celebrates the material world, goods, products, Uh, the very harvest of the land. Christianity is not opposed to wealth and prosperity. Christianity is not opposed to material blessing and enjoyment of the fruits of the earth. In all these things, Christianity celebrates the goods that these commandments speak to. But in each of these three commands, we are seeing that limits are placed on the way in which we might enjoy them. We are not to seek justice being served in any cavalier fashion. We cannot, in desperado ways, go out and serve justice on our own. In Romans 12, Paul tells us that we're not to avenge ourselves, but we're to leave it to God to serve justice. Because we trust that God will put the world to rights, we are not called to serve justice in every case. We are not called to abuse or even murder someone, to hate someone, whether in act or in feelings and intentions. Though sexual intimacy is celebrated, we are limited in the ways in which we're to enjoy it. It is located within the loving exercise of an appropriate marriage. We are not to go out and seek sexual pleasure in any way imaginable. Rather, God has designed certain ways and certain forms in which sexual union is to be expressed. The Bible unpacks a sexual ethic whereby we flourish, uh, whereby we express not simply physical union, but genuine relational intimacy, the kind of one flesh union that God has designed us for, and that so beautifully images the kind of relationship we have with Jesus Christ. Finally, though the Bible celebrates the good of the material world and the blessing of wealth and prosperity, we do see uh, that wealth is not to be accumulated in any which way. Rather, we are to work well, to work thoughtfully, to work selflessly, and certainly not to take that which does not belong to us. Theft, whether in overt or more subtle ways, is a cheap manipulation 
of property. It's an easy way to get that which we might covet, that which we might desire. God's not opposed to us having blessings, to us owning property, to us enjoying material prosperity, but God limits the way in which we might go after it. He calls us to trust Him, to pray for daily bread, to work, to be honest, to use equitable measures in our exchanges with others. God calls us even to be selfless, to turn the other cheek and to bend to the whims of others uh, as much as is possible. God calls us to be sacrificial. And though we can enjoy wealth and though we can enjoy prosperity in some occasions, we are not called to place it on a pedestal and to do anything we possibly can to attain it. Again, each of these commandments will only be honored or fulfilled at any point. Any of these temptations will only be stymied if we have a deep and profound trust that God is our Almighty Father. I'll only restrain my anger to react to someone who has mistreated me if I believe that God ultimately is the Lord and governor of all things. I'll only spurn the lustful temptation of inappropriate sex if I do believe that my God and Father has designed for me to find relational intimacy in appropriate ways and that he will provide deep and profound friendship that will meet my deepest social needs. I'll only be able to avoid the temptation to cheat on taxes or to steal in various subtle ways if I do believe God provides manna from heaven. That he not only provides the bread of life for my eternal needs, but he really does call me to receive from him daily bread for my earthly needs, reminding me that just as the lilies of the field and the birds of the air provided for, so my father will surely provide for his earthly sons his earthly daughters, his very image. The sixth, the seventh, and the eighth commands are radical. They call us to love. They limit the ways in which we seek earthly goods. But ultimately, they're acts that are performed or temptations that are refused simply because we entrust ourselves to another. It's remarkably freeing to know that the pathway to obeying these commandments as well is simply to obey the first commandment, to entrust ourselves to God in Christ Jesus, to believe that he is our Father and he is almighty, to believe the gospel in daily profound ways, that God who meets our everlasting needs is a God who meets our earthly needs. So we needn't go out and make justice on our own. We needn't go out and get sex as we may. We needn't go out and take whatever goods are there to be taken. We can trust that our Father will care, our Father will provide, our Father will give. That's the kind of being he is. That's the kind of character he's proven himself to have. As Romans 8 tells us, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him give us all other things? Because he was willing to sacrifice his son, his only son on my behalf, to meet my most profound need, I sure can believe that he'll meet my daily needs. For justice for friendship and intimacy, for material blessing and prosperity. I can turn to him prayerfully, honestly, boldly, authentically, and I can restrain myself from going out and trying to play God, to be my own ultimate provider, to shape the course of my life. I can live dependently, by faith, precisely because he's proven himself to be so very faithful in the gospel of Jesus. That's what it means. That's what it means to keep the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth commandments.